Well, that's one uh, stage that I'm currently at, which is uh, finishing the biocomplete composting uh, methodology, which um, I, I hit a bit of a stalemate and, and I have all three successive piles completed. And now I'm at the maturation phase, which I've been in for about three or four months now. And so I'm just kind of, it's kind of like a hurry up and wait situation that I just slowly just wait and have my uh, fungi, my fungal biomass numbers reach the proper numbers. Now, my nematode numbers are great. My protozoan numbers are great. My bacteria numbers are all at the minimums. Uh, my ciliate numbers are, are very low, but uh, that's one of the biggest challenges I've seen when it comes to building compost is the, is that patient process with growing fungi. And what advice could you give to you know either either me or, or other people that are in that same process or at that same point where now we're waiting for fungi to do its thing? What what advice could you give us? Um, I probably would point you towards what you are doing with the woody materials before you ever put them into the pile. Um, so have a pile of these kinds of wood chips and inoculate those wood chips with the mixture of really good fungi that you've probably got growing in your compost piles. So take some handfuls from there and inoculate the, mm. the, that woody material. Make sure you keep it covered so that uh, moisture in, through a, a dry summertime period, you know, through the wintertime, cover it so when you get snow, if you get snow, uh, when that snow melts, it'll put absolutely everything back into a very um, stressed condition. And so quite often you'll lose some of your fungi because they just can't stand freezing water, freezing mm. rain coming through the compost pile as that snow melts and it moves into your compost pile. You have put everybody into uh, dormancy in a, mm. you know, in a very painful way. Uh, sure. So protect your plants, protect that material by putting them under a tarp. Now I'm, I'm in quite a cold condition. I'm in zone 6A in the Rocky Mountain region and all my compost piles are in the garage at the moment. And um, the last time I checked, which is a, I would say two to three months ago, I kind of just let them sit. Um, and I did see some rhizomorphs when I was moving the piles from outside to inside. So that was a good sign. But um, uh, my fungal biomass numbers were about 44 micrograms per gram uh, when I put everything into the garage. What would I do or what would I monitor in order to continue to increase those numbers to our minimum 135? Um, I take a look at some of the fungi that you have. Mm -hmm. um, and, and probably what I would do is take some foods for the fungi that you lack in that pile and try to bring those fungal species along. Even going out into the forest and digging down through the um, O horizon, when you move that whatever is up there, so dead leaves and things like that where you can tell what plant they came from, and, you know, entirely undecomposed, and it would worry me a little bit that those leaves weren't decomposing in the fall period, they really should, there should be enough uh, fungi out there to do that decomposition process, especially if you had some decent rains. And so all of that organic material is now the organic layer at the surface of the soil. But dig through that and get to that part of the soil that has that really rich 70% cocoa chocolate color. And that's where you're going to find inoculative, some really good fungi, and pull some of that. You don't need much. You know, a handful is going to inoculate five or six piles. Mm -hmm. So bring that back so you've got a wider diversity. It may just be a lack of diversity that's kind of hampering your ability to grow those really good fungi. Mm -hmm. They may be in there. You might want to pick some fungal foods. And so like a humic acid, and please, you know, make sure that it's really humic acid. There's, there are people in the world of humic acids that want to um, talk about a, a humic acid that has 10 to 12 carbons in it, and that's all. Well, hmm. 
that's not a humic acid. Sorry, that's you're, they've they've gotten hold of one teeny tiny part of the molecule and you know describing the chemical chemistry of that well but it's not a humic acid we want something that's got you know 5,000 10,000 carbons in that material and it's very easily utilized by the microorganisms by fungi as you said fungi um, they like to pull apart very complex materials so obviously um, you know you need a buffet if you're gonna feed uh, fungi yep if we, we'd like to have, you know, like a thousand species of fungi in your compost pile, and each one likes a little bit different food, each one has different requirements of temperature and moisture and how much moving and mixing of the pile is happening. Some fungi like slightly more disturb disturbed, other fungi don't want any disturbance at all, and if you disturb them, you cause them to go into dormant conditions. So you've got the whole gamut in there. So when that compost gets out on your land and you're trying to grow plants, you will have somebody growing every second of every day throughout you know, the whole day, night, and on into winter. The most rapid rates of decomposition ever recorded on this planet were from uh, the Rocky Mountains and mm -hmm. through some of the work that we did um, with uh, Dave Coleman's group and uh, looking at a, a, a sequence from the disturbed um, short grass prairie through tall grass prairie into high mountain meadows and then into the forested shrubs and trees mm -hmm. um, and making certain that we had all the proper biology in there the most rapid rates of decomposition occurred in the winter time under wow. the snow and so getting those organisms back into your places that you're going to go pull f that diversity we want to be working on that as well because all the glyphosate sprays all of the toxic mm. chemicals they blow with the wind mm. and it's like there was a study done in Australia where they were applying uh, pesticides up around uh, Ingham um, and up in that area and they tagged some of that um, material so they could determine how far downwind that pesticide actually carried wow. and it was over 500 miles away so if you think about the Great Plains of the United States and the amount of toxic chemicals we're spraying on there's no surprise why we get things up in the mountains in Wyoming and or and Colorado that are showing the damage hmm. to their food webs and they're not functioning properly. We think that that because it's 500 miles or more away that it's not being impacted, but it is. We have a lot of work and restoration to do right. on this planet before we can kind of pat ourselves on the back and say we did, we've done the job. Be sure to like this video and subscribe so you don't miss any new Soul Food Web or homesteading content.